The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to the August Pacific Northwest Dews Drought and Climate Outlook webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Holly Prendeville. I'm the coordinator of the USDA Northwest Climate Hub. This is a bi-monthly webinar series that's hosted by NIDIS, Pacific Northwest Climate Impact Research Consortium, and the Northwest Climate Hub. It's designed to provide stakeholders in the Pacific Northwest with timely drought and climate information. Each webinar is tailored to reflect recent, current, and forecasted conditions and climatic events. And also it includes discussions of observed impacts and other relevant updates from across the region. A recording of this webinar will be posted on drought.gov later this week. And PDFs of the presentations can be accessed by emailing Britt Parker, um, the coordinator of the Pacific Northwest Dues. Note, after today's webinar, there'll be an opportunity to provide feedback to help us improve this webinar series. So please take a moment and tell us what you think. Next slide, please. Um, today's speakers include Nick Bond with the Office of uh, Washington State Climatologist who will present the climate recap and current conditions. Then Jeremy Wolf with the National Weather Service Spokane Weather Forecast Office will present the climate outlook. Next we'll have Katherine Hegovich with the University of Idaho and CERC who will speak about the U.S. Water Watcher. And finally we'll have Lauren Parker with the University of California, Santa Barbara and USDA Clim California Climate Hub who will talk about irrigation demands for specialty crops. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before we move into the presentations, we'll briefly highlight the partners that make this webinar series happen. The Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Research Consortium, or CERC, is a climate science to climate action team funded by NOAA's Regional Integrated Science and Assessments Program. CERC supports communities, policymakers, and resource managers in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Western Montana as they work to adapt to the changing climate by transforming the latest climate science and data into usable knowledge. Next slide, please. The Northwest Climate Hub develops and delivers science-based region-specific technologies and practical information that will assist agricultural and natural resource managers with climate-informed decision-making. Uh, please visit our website to get more information. And next, I'll hand it over to Elizabeth, who will be filling in for Britt Parker. Thank you, Holly. My name is Elizabeth Waite. I'm with NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDAS. And um, as Holly said, I'm standing in for Britt Parker, who is the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for the Pacific Northwest and Missouri River Basin. NIDAS's mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risks by providing those affected with the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and to better prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. We want to improve our understanding of how and why droughts affect society, the economy, and the environment, and to improve accessibility, dissemination, and use of early warning information for better drought risk management. NIDAS's approach to achieve that goal is to build the foundation of a national drought early warning system through the development of regional drought early warning systems, where networks of partners and stakeholders share information and actions that help communities cope with drought. While the ultimate goal is to build a national drought early warning system, we recognize that impacts and early warning information differ across the regions. Therefore, each dues has many of the same base ingredients of a national dues, but ultimately they have their own flavor to reflect the needs of that particular region. The Pacific Northwest dues was officially launched in February 2016, and our strategic plan is available on drought.gov. The roadmap for moving forward with the Pacific Northwest dues identifies existing and new drought-related activities in the region with priority areas focusing on improving monitoring and research for drought risk management, expanding drought early warning communications and outreach, optimizing information and collaborative networks, and enhancing drought planning and mitigation. So please mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will be on October 28, 2019. Registration information for these and other webinars can be found on drought.gov. And we will be holding our annual Pacific Northwest Dues Meeting 
on October 8 in Portland, Oregon, in conjunction with the Northwest Climate Conference. We hope that you can join us. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next, we will have Nick, who will give us a climate recap. Oh, sorry, All right. I forgot about the crowd, but we'll switch oh, over to Nick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, right, thank you. So, uh, good morning, and um, I just want to acknowledge the um, the help I've received from Karen Bombaco in uh, preparing these slides. So I'm just going to give you a quick climate recap. And um, here, uh, let's see, I do not have control of my screen, of the screen. Sorry about that. Um, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, let me, uh, I need to go back here. So um, what I, uh, it's a kind of matter of taste how far back in time you go. I, I've picked the last five months um, because the, let's face it, the weather of fall and early winter is kind of water under the bridge, pun intended. But if you look for the period of March through July of 2019, for the most part, it was near normal temperatures across the Pacific Northwest, a few spots with warmer than normal, cold spots in the Columbia Basin, parts of Western Montana. It's kind of refreshing to see some blue on a, um, a temperature anomaly map. In terms of precipitation, the plot on the right, the northern part of the Pacific Northwest actually extending into um, southeast BC was a little bit on the dry side, again, uh, March to July period. Uh, Eastern Oregon and Southern Idaho was on the wet side, and uh, you can see some actual very dry conditions there in uh, Western Washington, and a little bit more about that in a minute. If we uh, take a little bit um, a more recent perspective, last 60 days, uh, and in particular, the end of June into last week. Again, temperature anomaly map on the left, precipitation on the right. It's kind of a different picture uh, here where it's been mostly on the cool side for much of the Pacific Northwest, a few spots there near normal. And in this case, um, we've had some beneficial rains in the in the Cascades in Western Washington. It's been dry in Idaho and Eastern Oregon. Of course, it's a uh, dry time of year anyway. Uh, to give some specifics for just the month of July for the Northwest as a whole, the temperatures were um, uh, a little less than a degree below normal and the uh, July precipitation was about two thirds of normal. What I think is kind of interesting is if you separate out, again, for the last 60 days, the um, maximum temperatures versus the minimum temperatures across the region. And so the maximum temperatures of the plot in the upper left, uh, the blue showing pretty consistently across the region, cooler than normal temperatures for the region as a whole. Not too many heat waves or very long ones, but uh, for the minimum temperatures in the lower right, you get a much different perspective where um, they've been consistently warmer than normal across much of the region. And this is something that we're seeing in climate trends also. And if um, it is consistent with what we're seeing in terms of low level humidity levels. This um, particular uh, parameter, the uh, vapor pressure deficit anomaly from the Northwest Climate Toolbox, it, basically um, the greener it is, the more humid it is uh, right near the surface relative to normal. The browns would be drier than normal. And so you can see across much of the Northwest, it's been a little bit on the moist side. The um, uh, kind of regional circulation patterns go in with that, again, for that same 60-day period is shown here in terms of the distribution of 500 uh, hectopascal geopotential anomalies. And what you can see is um, 
Uh, the lower than normal heights off the coast of the Pacific Northwest has meant a little bit more flow in from off the ocean, and that has kind of contributed to a relatively mild summer. Because there's been less um, of the kind of the dregs of the desert southwest monsoon getting into the, at least the southern part of the Pacific Northwest, that's why it's been kind of on the dry side there. It, it turns out um, a lot of the moisture for that region comes from the desert southwest, not off the ocean. All right. Um, and we are having some drought impacts and not the sort of hardships we had in 2015 by any means, but in various parts of Washington State in particular, this shows some very low flows in um, the upper part of the watershed of the Yakima River. What we're seeing is not so much uh, impacts on agriculture. There are some minor ones, but um, mostly on the west side of the state, um, from an ecosystem perspective, very low flows in streams, warm temperatures, probably um, hard time for trout and adult salmon and for the survival of the juvenile salmon. Um, just a little bit more about the water. Uh, this, uh, this plot here on the left shows the basically soil moisture um, anomalies across the Pacific Northwest. Again, uh, the uh, showing the rel relatively dry conditions, um, especially west of the Cascades. And even though there hasn't been much precipit precipitation recently in eastern Oregon and Idaho, they're doing okay just because, um, for the most part, the, the late winter and spring was okay for them in terms of precipitation. If you look at the plot on the right, and here hopefully I'm uh, kind of scooping what Catherine's going to be saying, just showing the um, a map of the 28-day average stream flows as of uh, last week. A lot of those red dots in the, uh, the western part of our region indicate the really low flows that I've been talking about. All right. Um, all this uh, kind of comes together in the depiction of you know, drought conditions on the U.S. Drought Monitor. It turns out uh, Washington State is in kind of you know, I think the worst shape anywhere in the country, we actually have a few pockets of D2 severe drought, again, on the west side of the state. And, um, you know, basically dry conditions in an arc from western Oregon across the northern part of Washington into Montana. So just to sum up, um, last five months, and especially if you were to go back six months and include the very cold month of February 2019, have been on the mild cool side, which is a kind of a welcome relief uh, compared to conditions we've had um, many of the last few years. Uh, precipitation totals have been um, again, uh, looking at a longer term per perspective, mostly below normal in western Washington and above normal in much of Oregon and southern Idaho. The summer so far, um, we've been um, uh, not too bad and especially uh, kind of maximum temperatures on the cool side, but definitely warmer than historical norms in terms of the minimum temperatures across virtually the whole region. And the place that we've, you know, really are uh, concerned about, again, from a kind of stream side um, perspective, ecosystem perspective, is Western Washington. And with that, I'll close and turn it over to Jeremy. Thank you very much, Nick. Next, we'll have Jeremy Wilk will give us the climate outlook. All right. So got quite a bit of uh, information to go through. So uh, we're going to talk about an update on El Nino, go into the fall winter outlooks, as well as the September fire outlook, uh, the latest drought outlook, as well as the water supply forecast and a flood outlook through December 1st. So let's go to the next slide here. So. The latest ENSO alert system status from the Climate Prediction Center, they issued the final El Nino advisory as ENSO neutral conditions are present. 
The equatorial sea surface temperatures are above average in the western and central Pacific Ocean and below average in the eastern Pacific. And uh, the patterns, uh, besides just the, uh, the uh, ocean temperatures, the patterns with the convection and the winds have also been consistent with Enzo neutral. So that is what's most likely uh, going to occur as we go into the fall and winter. All right, so here is a slide showing the historic El Nino and La Nino or La Nina episodes. Uh, this goes back to 2007, uh, but you can see uh, last winter we uh, peaked at a weak El Nino and the anomalies over the last couple three month periods have been trending down. And uh, the next slide uh, will show some of that cooling starting to show up. There was, uh, if we go back to September of 2018, there at the top, and then August of 2019 at the bottom, you can see a lot of warm uh, water anomalies uh, all the way up through July. But then just recently in the past month, the uh, anomalies have been trending a little bit cooler, uh, uh, especially in the eastern equatorial Pacific. And the latest uh, Nino 3.4 region anomaly is at just 0 0.1. You can see uh, uh, and it's the Nino 3.4 region that gets monitored for El Nino and La Nina episodes. And you can see since uh, April or so, the trend has been going down as far as the, uh, the water anomalies. Uh, they've been trending cooler. And here's an average of sea surface temperature anomalies over the past 30 days. And you can see the cool water anomalies there in the eastern equatorial Pacific, and then still some warm water out there in the uh, uh, central and western equatorial Pacific. Uh, and this plot here, as we look at the upper ocean heat anomalies, to me is a pretty good sign for monitoring the trends in the ocean temperatures, because you're not looking at just the surface, you're also looking at the whole upper ocean uh, heat content. And you can see uh, since April, those anomalies really uh, decreased down to near zero. And it's been oscillating a bit, but it's been uh, closer to uh, uh, neutral uh, conditions as far as the upper ocean heat anomalies. All right, so here's the latest CPC IRI probabilistic ENZO outlook. Uh, it shows that ENZO neutral conditions are most likely to continue as we go through the winter. You can see uh, odds in the 50 to 55 percent range. There is still a, a chance that El Nino could resurge or that even La Nina conditions could develop. Uh, but the way the trends are going right now is with the uh, the heat uh, anomalies going down, it seems more likely that we would have uh, the ENZO neutral conditions. And here is the IRI CPC uh, Pacific Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature model outlook. So this is looking at all the different model projections. Uh, the red line here is the average of all the models and the green line is an average of some statistical model uh, forecast. So you can see the green line is forecasting uh, weak El Nino conditions as we go through the winter, but the red line uh, is going, keeping things in the Enzo neutral territory. All right, so we'll look now at the CPC uh, outlooks and uh, We'll begin with September, and you're going to notice a common pattern on all of these for our uh, region across Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. And you can see there's uh, moderate odds there, uh, elevated odds of temperatures being warmer than normal. When we look at the precipitation outlook, uh, the forecast is for equal chances, so no clear indication how the precipitation is going to turn out for the month of September. Now, when I go through the rest of these, you're going to see a pretty much identical forecast. Here's the uh, September through November forecast, continued uh, elevated odds for warmer than normal, equal chances for precipitation. When we go to the winter outlook, same story, still the elevated odds of warmer than normal and equal chances for precipitation. Now, the 
the main reasoning behind the uh, elevated odds of warmer than normal is uh, uh, their basing CPC is basing a lot on uh, decadal trends where they look at the observed conditions over the last 10 to 15 years compared to the longer term climatology. So the trend has been for slightly uh, warmer winters. So the uh, that's why the uh, probabilities are weighted that way. Now I want to just show a few maps as far as what is the pattern we typically see during Enzo neutral years. Typically the polar jet stream is sending uh, cold air masses into the upper Midwest, whereas the Pacific jet stream is sending uh, storm systems right into our region. And when we look at the uh, composite map since 1980, so we're looking at uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, about 13 or 14 uh, Enzo neutral occurrences since 1980. And in all those occurrences, if we average out what happened, uh, temperatures were at or slightly cooler than normal and precipitation was around normal. And this is for uh, the fall uh, time frame. Uh, near normal across Washington, but slightly drier than normal over Oregon and parts of Idaho. Now, when we look at the winter uh, composite maps, uh, you can see it really matches what uh, that typical, uh, what that jet stream pattern often looks like in Enzo neutral years. You can see the colder anomalies across the upper Midwest, uh, right around normal or slightly below normal in the Pacific Northwest and precipitation with the jet stream aimed at us. It actually shows the, the train influence across Washington with wetter than normal in the Cascades uh, at or slightly drier than normal as you get into the rain shadow across uh, eastern Washington and then wetter than normal again across Idaho and Montana. So uh, that's what we typically see. Now the one takeaway I want everyone to hear from this is that not every neutral year is alike. So don't take the typical, uh, what typically happens in a neutral year as that's what's going to happen. Because if we look at every neutral episode since 1980, you can see in 1980, it was a very mild winter, whereas in 92, it was, it was colder than normal across all of the region. So you can see there is a lot of variability from year to year. And if we uh, kind of summarize all this, uh, Six of them turned out cooler than normal, five were near normal, and three were warmer than normal. And as far as precipitation goes, we see a similar deal. We see uh, wetter than normal some on some occurrences, whereas there's been some that have been drier than normal. And uh, you know, if we summarize those, you can, those, you can see, again, quite a bit of variability. So the CPC forecast of equal chances uh, uh, based on history of what happens in neutral years is a uh, looks like a good forecast uh, and often there's other factors other oscillations that affect ultimately what happens and those are hard to predict more than a few weeks out in advance all right so let's move on to the fire outlooks this was the one issued in August and you can see some uh, above normal fire potential across parts of Washington and Oregon now uh, the Northwest Coordination Center uh, did update their forecast in the middle of August. Uh, it's available on their webpage. And when they updated it, they actually did take out the above normal across Washington. Uh, and really the only place that has above normal is just uh, uh, from about Salem South into Southwest Oregon. The drought outlook as we go into November is calling for drought to continue across the region. But again, we'll, we'll see exactly how that precipitation pans out, but there's no indications at this point that uh, that lean towards uh, expansion or reduction in drought. The water supply forecast, uh, because of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the drought conditions, we're seeing a water supply forecast in the 50 to 75 percent range across several areas of northern Washington, Idaho, uh, southern British Columbia, and parts of western Washington, and also northwest Montana. And then the probability of exceeding flood stage through December 1st, you can see overall fairly low probabilities across the area. There are some uh, 
chances there on some of the gauges there in western Washington as if we get a, a fall atmospheric river we can definitely see a lot of rain in a short period of time so can't be ruled out but overall the, the chances at this point are, are showing uh, fairly low across the region. So in summary, and so neutral conditions are favored through the winter. The outlooks uh, favor elevated odds of warmer than normal with uh, equal chances for precipitation. Near normal fire potential as we head into September, except across Southwest Oregon. Drought is forecast to continue over Northwest Oregon, Western Washington, the mountains of Northern Washington and Idaho, with a low flood risk for most rivers through November. Uh, so that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And if uh, you all have questions for our speakers, please put them in the chat box and we'll get to them after they all have presented. Next, we'll turn to Katherine Hegovich. Catherine, sorry, you for, are... I... I am muted. I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay, great. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about the U.S. Water Watcher, which is a web tool that was developed by John Abatsaglu and I at the University of Idaho with support from NIDIS and also CERC. And this tool can be found on the web at um, climatetoolbox.org. Um, let's see. Yep. Um, and then there you can click on the tool name for this and as shown here. Um, and so our motivation for creating this tool um, was in noting that there are many different types of drought um, depending on where the water shortage or increased demand lies from meteorological drought, from precipitation deficits to ecological drought, from uh, deficits in water for forests and fish. And there are a lot of drought metrics out there to help us monitor the US, and a few of them are shown here, um, where SPI, Standardized Precipitation Index, um, and EDI um, are both standardized indices in precipitation and potential evapotranspiration. And PDSI is a standardized index giving information about soil moisture. And finally, uh, VegDry, um, includes some satellite information on vegetation dryness and also incorporates other drought metrics. So you'll notice in um, the maps that these different drought metrics supply on their websites that they all use different color schemes um, to show the, the dryness. And they also, if you look into the details, use different breaks on their um, on their color on their color schemes great breaks for precipitation or the different indices so this makes it difficult to compare them equally and um, given the importance of the u.s drought monitor um, maps as being one of the most visible report of drought over the u.s where um, us federal dollars are assigned to some of these different drought classifications more and more drought metrics are being shown in drought monitor colors but not all of them yet we don't have that consistency yet uh, the drought monitor reports that their colors are assigned um, using a bunch of drought metrics and local impacts where the colors represent ranges in percentiles. So here, for example, a D4 drought category um, is exceptional drought, and it's used when current conditions, say of precipitation, are in the lowest two percentile of precipitation seen historically, which is worse than the one in four year, one in 50 year drought. So what we did is we created the U.S. Water Watcher to remedy some of, some, some of the gaps that uh, some of these gaps. Um, we set up a system to acquire real-time percentile drought metrics from many different sources, including the Northwest Climate Toolbox, NRCS, Water Watch, uh, the Groundwater Watch, and NOAA ESRL. And we translated these raw percentiles to wet and dry classifications using um, the same percentile ranges as the U.S. Drought Monitor, so this is the, the dry category here, and then we symmetrically um, extended this to the wet side um, also, so we have this percentile scheme here in different colors. Um, and then we did this for all of the metrics listed here, um, and this is actually a drop down from our Water Watcher tool, where you can see that in some cases there are duplicate sources for looking at the same metric, so for example, um, uh, with soil moisture, we have soil moisture from Grace and from uh, Vic, 
um, and we have some other duplicates also here. But we kind of categorized some of these into the different types of drought that they fall under, while um, some of these metrics could potentially be in different um, in several types of drought categories. And then we have our um, our color bar that goes along with this. And so the result was a dynamic web tool shown here, which is the U.S. Water Watcher, to um, to look at maps for uh, these data sets. Um, so for reference, we have the U.S. Drought Monitor map, monitor map the, in the upper right corner um, showing the dry side of these um, moisture extremes. And you can actually go back in time and look at old drought monitor maps also um, from by clicking on the little drop down for under options. Um, and then on the left side of the screen, we have a two by two, we have four maps laid out in a two by two grid, um, which are customizable by clicking on these different uh, option gear buttons. Um, so, so that you can select what's being showed in the different um, in the different four maps, and these maps can be zoomed, panned, and clicked on to get specific location information. So, for example, here, uh, Olympia was Washington was chosen, and you can see what um, the map for the different types of drought indicated show for that uh, show for Olympia, and then on each of the little drop um, pop-ups. And this is an example of the drop down here. And then in the lower right corner, um, there is a summary for that point location that was chosen. So here, Olympia, that shows a summary over these different maps at that point location. So you can see that precipitation, it was abnormally dry. For the closest stream flow, it was um, extremely extreme drought for that, for that location. Uh, soil moisture through PDSI was a severe drought. And then energy release component here, which is a measure of vegetation dryness, was actually wet. Um, and then finally, what um, the U.S. Drought Monitor says for that location. So you can see that in a single location, you can actually both have drought and you can have wetness, depending on what category or type of drought or moisture you are looking at. So, um, oops, sorry. So the goals of our site, um, one second. So the goals of our site were to show some different drought types at different time scales so that people can reconcile how a region can be in drought and and not drought at the same time. Um, show the wet side also, not just the dry side as the drought monitor does. Use consistent colors um, so that maps can be compared equally um, and have these maps all in one spot again for easy comparison. Um, and then also have fine resolution maps that are at the resolution of the data sets that are that are used um, so you can get better spatial resolution on the drought maps. And then finally to have location specific information for a specific location, um, how the different moisture metrics tease out for that different location. So for an application um, of the drought monitor, that's a current events. Um, we can look at this past summer for Washington State. Um, in April and May, Washington State, uh, a demising snowpack caused Washington State to declare a drought emergency. Um, and in late May, the Department of Ecology actually used the Water Watcher to tweet out how the data added up um, in looking at how the deficits in precipitation led to deficits in stream flow and soil moisture and how it was all um, Part of the part of the store was deficits in snow water equivalent in uh, the diminishing snowpacks in the mountains. So, in looking at the water watcher, we can actually go back in time and look at the data for early May, which um, was tweeted out here, and we can see that that water year precipitation was low for that northwest corner, um, and also um, around into Upper Idaho and Montana, and that signature was also um, mimicked um, in the U.S. Drought Monitors. Um, classification for that for that those regions um, and these deficits led to some deficits in stream flows in some different areas um, around the state and into Oregon even uh, soil moisture was being was low also uh, in these yellows and reds and then finally the snowpack was uh, a lot more diminished in in early May here but then come August 1st, um, for surface water impacts, um, we were seeing some low stream flows in much of um, Washington and Idaho, some low reservoir numbers, um, but not too bad here. Um, I don't have that much, much data actually in this, in the reservoirs. And then for agriculture and ecology, um, there were also some 
low soil moistures all over. Um, and, um, and then finally, um, the, for natural dryness of the vegetation, the energy release component showed the northwest corner here um, pretty wet, but did have um, a big swath of the region here that was showing dryness, which could have been uh, a reason for the fire forecasts um, in this region uh, being increased. And again, um, looking at the, so you could see here that the impacts, um, they, there were there were water impacts, but um, we just didn't hear about them as much as we had heard in, in previous drought years like 2017, 18, and 15. And a major reason why we didn't see that was, as Nick Bond has already said, is that that water shortage was not coupled with the high summer heat stress that we normally expect for our region. Temperatures this summer, especially in July, were just below normal. Here I'm showing maximum daily temperatures, even for California, which is shocking. And um, we can also, and we can see that from these two figures from the, from other nor uh, climate toolbox tools. Um, so. And so you can see here in the blue, the below normal temperatures um, over the west. And on the second, we second here on the right, we can see how 2019, which is the red dot here, um, was a lot, um, was, a, was very below normal, both in precipitation, um, precipitation on the y-axis here and uh, July maximum daily temperature on the X. So it was below normal in precipitation, but it was also below normal in temperatures, while the other um, drought impact years that we saw, 2015, 18, and 17, um, were all both below normal in precipitation, but above normal in temperature. Um, and then finally, we can, we can really see why at least one impact to the fire season um, was pretty lackluster for this summer through a new metric that the toolbox has called the vapor pressure deficit, which Nick Bond also looked at, um, which gives information on atmospheric drying. And this is a good complement to the metric of potential evapotranspiration, which gives information on atmospheric thirst. So atmospheric drying um, causes natural vegetation to dry out, making it ripe for ignition by forest fires. And luckily this year, we're looking here at vapor pressure deficit percentiles again. Um, and we can see here that um, the, the atmosphere was wet um, in 2019 for uh, July and August, um, but in 2018, 17, and 15, the atmosphere was not wet. It was dry, and it was drying out the vegetation, making the fire season more severe. Yep. So in conclusion, uh, the U.S. Water Watcher can be used in a couple different ways. Um, you can fix time to compare current maps of different drought types. You can fix the metric and create a time series of maps for a single drought metric. You can fix the location and compare drought metrics for a single location. And finally, you can recall specific years by comparing maps like, say, to a previous drought year. And that ends my presentation. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. Now we'll turn over to our final speaker, Lauren Parker. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren. Um, I'm with the University of California, Davis, and the USDA California Climate Hub currently. I was previously with the University of Idaho, which is where this work got started. Um, it was funded in part with the Northwest Climate Hub. And I wanna thank at the top here, um, Catherine, who um, was instrumental in getting um, some of these data turned into web tools, actually all of these data turned into usable web tools, um, and John Abazoglu, who uh, was also a big part of this project. So um, I'm gonna talk about future irrigation demands for Northwest specialty crops. And I'm hoping that you all are seeing my main screen and um, not my notes to myself. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so climate change in the Northwest model, uh, some models that are based on crop temperature needs that were developed over the last couple of years show that there may be opportunities for expanding some high value perennial crops across the Northwest as a function of climate change. Um, so here, as an example on this slide, we see um, that there may be some opportunities for, ex uh, for example, expanding cherry production. 
Presently, um, the temperature is suitable for cherry production um, in all of the area that you see in blue here. By the 2050s, uh, at the rate that we're on, um, we see that there's quite a bit of opportunity for expansion for cherries. And those same, um, those same temperature-based uh, suitability models for these crops can show what it is that's limiting production. So in this instance, for Parma, Idaho, we might see that uh, frost can be a bit of a challenge for your cherries um, in about three out of every 10 years. But in the future, we expect that those conditions um, might improve. So expanding specialty crop production across the Northwest um, you know, it might be a good economic move too for markets where California production can, can decline. And again, going back to our um, maps here, we see that presently we have, a, you know, pretty good suitability for growing cherries in Southern California, but by the 2050s, that market um, may be on the outs. So, so Northwest growers, these are the sorts of things that Northwest growers may be interested in. But if you want to expand your specialty crop production, you need to have water. Um, and as perennials, these crops are going to need water year round. Much of that water will uh, be needed during the dry summer months. And so that means it's likely going to have to come from irrigation. The amount of water required to meet a crop's water demand uh, is determined by the crop's evapotranspiration. And because evapotranspiration increases with warmer temperatures, then we expect that climate change will increase our temperatures, which will increase our evapotranspiration rates. And so this in turn, again, because we have these dry summers in the Northwest, um, we're, we're likely to see greater demands for irrigation water. But just how much of an increase in irrigation water demand uh, depends on the individual crop's water use, and that's going to vary um, at different phases of crop development. So if we want to model irrigation needs um, and we want to estimate what those might look like in the future, one of the first things we need to understand is the timing of crop development. When's the crop going to be flowering? When's the fruit going to be growing? When will the fruit mature? And this is because each development phase of a crop has a different crop coefficient. Um, for anybody who's not familiar, a crop coefficient is the difference between the crop's evapotranspiration and the evapotranspiration of a reference surface. So in this case, well-watered grass. And when we multiply our crop coefficient by our reference evapotranspiration, or ET, we get an estimate of how much water the crop is using given environmental conditions um, and the physiological characteristics of the plant. So once we had modeled the development of the crop, um, we were able to change our crop coefficient during the year, um, shift it as our crop develop, develops, um, keeping that timing in line on a year-to-year -year basis. And then in the example of cherries, we might see that um, prior to bloom, our crop coefficient, our KC value here, is low. And then as the plant ramps up, it needs more water, right? Our crop coefficient increases. And that's also occurring um, at the same time as we have these warmer summer temperatures, our evapotranspiration rate of our reference surface is also increasing. And so our crop is entering into its full development phase in the summer and our crop water demand is highest because our KC value is highest, our evapotranspiration rate is highest during the summer. Um, and then as uh, the crop is matured, and um, harvested, and then as the tree goes into senescence, our crop water demand drops off again. So understanding how our crop water demand varies throughout the year allows us to get um, a, a much better estimate of crop water demands than just simply looking at um, evapotranspiration rates alone. So once we had the water demand for each development phase for each crop throughout the year calculated, we could feed that into a water balance model. And this is my um, little hand-drawn hand um, hand conceptual model that I created. Uh, we used a modified Thornthwaite-Mather climatic water balance model um, for this. And we ran the model at a monthly time interval for each year over um, the different climatic periods that we examined. 
And we assumed a constant soil moisture holding capacity uh, of 150 millimeters over the full domain. Now that's not obviously the case in reality, different soils will, soil types will have different soil um, water holding capacities. And in the future, it would be possible to use soil survey data to improve um, our estimates. But at the moment, I wanted to make a note that our, all of our estimates are based on this 150 millimeter constant value. So the water balance model tracks fluxes in water, soil moisture runoff. Um, essentially, we're adding water through precipitation. We're filling up our soil like it's a bucket. Um, we're allowing any excess water to run off. And then we're removing water from that bucket based uh, solely on crop evapotranspiration. So our crop um, KC value, our crop uh, coefficient multiplied by our reference of evapotranspiration. Now, as the crop is using water from the soil, we have to add water to meet our crop water demand. And because it doesn't always rain, anything that uh, any added water that's necessary to meet crop water demand has to come from irrigation. So in that way, we're able to calculate the amount of crop water that has demand that has to be met with irrigation. Um, you may be familiar with the term climatic water deficit. Uh, this is often used in um, ecological terms. In agronomic terms, we're contextualizing the same concept as the irrigation requirements that are necessary to meet the full water demand of the crop. So that's sort of the background on where all of this irrigation um, demand estimates came from. And then we took that and um, thanks to, again, to Catherine, turned it into this um, great web tool where you can visualize across space and across time changes in irrigation demand for a selected crop. So crop irrigation needs were computed for five different high value perennials. Here I'm just showing the example for cherries. We provide a 20 model median, um, climatological average, annual amount of expected irrigation needs. So what we're saying is that, you know, in um, the mid-century under high emission scenario, you might expect to apply about 35 inches of water per year in Moscow to grow your cherries. Of course, in warmer, drier years, you're going to need more. In cooler, wetter years, you may need less. The model was run over the historical time period and also two future time periods, both an early and a mid 21st century period for two future climate scenarios, a lower emission scenario and a higher emission scenario. And within the tool, you can toggle here your future emissions, your time period that you're interested in. You can choose one of the handful of crops that we um, ran this exercise for. And then in addition to seeing uh, those changes over time and space, for any individual location, you can see changes in irrigation demand for your selected crop graphically. A couple of things I want to mention about these estimates of future irrigation demand. Um, we're assuming full irrigation, meaning we're giving the crop all of the water that it desires, with the exception of grapes. In grapes, we employ a 70% deficit irrigation strategy between veraison and maturation. And this is because water stressing in grapevine is a really common practice in wine growing. We're also assuming that the plants are all fully mature. This is important because younger trees and vines tend to be more water efficient. And then um, the other thing to note is that these crop models that the irrig irrigation demand estimates are based on were created for a single crop and typically for a single cultivar. So your mileage may vary if you are um, growing a different cultivar from uh, the, the one that these models were based upon. And then just really briefly, here's what the full web tool screen would look like. It's easy to change your location of interest by clicking around different locations on the map or selecting your location up here in the top left. Again, you can select the crop that you're interested in the emission scenario that you're interested in. You can visualize where the crop is currently grown based on some USDA data by turning on and off the crop, current crop extent. And again, you can change your time period that you're interested in. So just to wrap it up, a couple of key takeaways. Um, 
I always like to mention this when we're talking about um, climate projections. Model results are not a crystal ball. Um, there are a lot of a lot of things that can that can um, make a difference between what our models are telling us and what we're seeing on the ground. However, we expect that warming temperatures will provide opportunities for specialty crop expansion across the Northwest. Again, you have to think about though whether your water demands can be met. We expect that future irrigation needs will increase, but the timing and the amount of that increase is going to vary by crop and location. So you can um, toggle around on the tool and see what we're estimating um, for your crop of interest and your location of interest. One thing to note is that shifting phenology could provide some insulation from increased water demands, meaning that if you're able to harvest earlier, you could potentially in, uh, introduce a regulated deficit irrigation strategy earlier in the year and reduce your overall annual uh, irrigation water need. And then again, there are a ton of adaptive practices, whether it's cultivar or rootstock selection or a regulated deficit irrigation um, practice throughout the growing season that could provide some resiliency, both for existing orchards or vineyards, as well as any orchards of vineyards that might be planted down the road. And uh, that'll wrap it up for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, with that, we'll take questions. So please add, um, add your questions to the question box. Um, for the first question will be for Catherine. Uh, will the U.S. Water Watcher be discussed at the upcoming U.S. Drought Monitor Forum? I don't think so. <laughs> um, I'm not aware that it is at the U.S. Drought Monitor Forum, no. Okay. Um, we got a positive feedback. I always love those. Um, excellent presentations went a long way to answering questions I came in with and more. Thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, next, um, we have an interest in doing this kind of irrigation need forecast for a non-agricultural setting, turf grass. Do you have a category for that that could approximate that? That would be for Lauren. Um, no, not for turf grass. We don't. I would, I would think that, um, Turf grass might cl most closely uh, follow our estimates of potential evapotranspiration. And so then, then just running the water balance model with that as opposed to um, using the crop coefficients. But then if you have different um, water needs, you know, some of those grasses are certainly more drought resilient than others uh, that will um, impact your, your results. But at the moment, no, we don't have um, anything that would estimate um, different turf grasses. Thank you. If there are any additional questions, please add them to the question box. Um, for the moment, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth to just touch upon, touch upon Kokoros since we skipped that. Thank you, Holly. And uh, thanks very much, Nick and Jeremy, Catherine and Lauren, for your excellent presentations. Uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I just wanted to share a little bit with you about Coco Raz, um, which is um, a network that facilitates our drought early warning system for uh, precipitation. Um, for this drought early warning system, more precipitation observations are needed. So we encourage you to join Coco Ross, which is the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. It's a unique nonprofit, community-based network of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds working together to measure and map precipitation as well as condition reporting. So observations from Coco Ross observers of precipitation events and lack of precipitation are important to capture and they help improve our understanding of weather. So please um, sign up for Coco Ross and encourage others that you know to sign up. The uh, sign up is right there, www.cocoraz.org. Um, and here are Pacific Northwest Coco Ross contacts if you want additional information. Please uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, I see no additional questions. So with that, I thank you all for your presentations and for attending this webinar. Have a great day.